All right, everyone, let's get back to the to business here. So when last we, we left off, we were just doing the very boring, I believe it, boring stuff about logistics. Critical because we want to make sure we're all on the same page, but still um, boring. OK, so let's actually go. We already went through the course outline, so let's just jump on down to our review. And you're probably saying, well, don't I already know this stuff? Well, I would hope so, but I'm not holding my breath on many of these cases. So we're going to be looking at algorithms, most of this stuff, whether the data information, uh, what kind of how we write our code, um, how logic and arithmetic sort of work, how those operations work, what functions are. Most of this I'm going to breeze through quickly simply because I think most of you will have seen it. So what we're talking about is, um, I want to point out for algorithms at least, is I would like to make sure that each one of you, when you are working on your assignment or you're working on something, have a sheet of scrap paper and a pen with you. Yes, I know it sounds archaic, but just plotting out informally the algorithm, the approach that you're going to take is the only way. I don't know of a single programmer can't think of any programs at least that do not have a pad of paper near them at some point uh, all the time why because most of the time they can you know they can do a lot of it in their heads but every once in a while you hit something that you have to really think through for a while and that's when the piece of paper comes in you want a doodle right it's a doodle on a napkin and when we talked about algorithmic thinking that's what we were talking about the play around with some ideas to see what the best approach is that's why we all have whiteboards or we have a whiteboard nearby I have a white. I always make sure I have a whiteboard around me so I can doodle out my my code, how I think things should work, and go from there. But I don't proceed with coding until I know I have a plan. You don't write a novel by just starting writing it. It was dark and stormy night. You actually have an outline to your novel. Your, or at least you should. You have an outline to your novel, and you write. You know what's going to happen, and then you flesh out everything. Flesh out, flesh. Anyways. Um, you fill in all of the details later, but you need that outline. You need that structure, that framework. You need to have thought it through before you code. You don't code while thinking. It doesn't work for you. It always ends up badly. So this is how you can play around with your sort of, your algorithm is your recipe, your set of steps and processes that you get, that you use to make something work. Like writing how to sort, uh, code or how to find the minimum value in, in an array of numbers. We also looked at variables in bit 1400 and we had things like constants so things like when we wanted to have pi for example we had a constant and it was a constant integer but it you weren't allowed to change it afterwards. If it was a constant I could make it global anyone could see it if I wanted to but it meant you could not change it no matter if you wanted to or not. Strings ended up being constants in the end. If you gave me like a, uh, a bunch of uh, string text, it actually ends up being constant. You can't modify it. Uh, and we also had variables, so things that you could change, like int i is equal to 3. So we're going to look at these uh, in a second. But we had variables such as integers, floating point operators, doubles, which are double the size in, term, uh, in terms of the number of bits that we're using to store this, but they're, they're variable length. They're not linear data. We also had, with integers, we had long longs, which were twice as long as an integer. We had shorts, which were half the length of an integer. So it went from 16 bits as a short to 32 bits for an integer, at least for right now. It could change later on, to 64 bits for a long long. Right? These things can change over time. We also had chars or characters. And that was the one time where we said, yeah, that's pretty much guaranteed to be this length. It is one byte. A character is one byte. And most of most programs nowadays, that's one of the few things that they rely on. That's the size of a character. It is one byte. But you still shouldn't make that assumption. It has changed over the years. Uh, it is one byte in length, so therefore it can store values between 0 and 255, which is the no maximum number of numbers you can represent between zero with with eight bits, right? Is two to the power of eight, which is two hundred and fifty-six. So one less than that. So zero to two hundred fifty-five, we can represent two hundred fifty-six different numbers. Um, 
So we also have some basic operations as well. So we're looking at, and my screen just went. I don't know what's going on here. So we also have some basic operations. I'm going to pop it back up again. Uh, we looked at logic and arithmetic operations. So this would be thing, logic operations would be something like uh, this, double ands. And this would be something like, you know, plus. Basic arithmetic operations. We'll look at this when I do some live coding soon. And then if you took the course from somebody other than me, you may not have had this beaten to death, but I really hope you get it beaten to death right now. So we're going to make sure that we, we have that. I'm going to fix this. That plus looks terrible. There we go. Um, we looked at functions. If you do not know how to write a function, learn now. It is absolutely critical. You need to have those down cold. A function is effectively the following. I got a box. I got stuff that goes into the box. I have stuff that comes out of the box. It's a magic box, right? A function, all it is, is a chunk of code that does something. Things can go into the function. Things can come out of the function. It can do some operation. It is like a widget or a something in a car, right? It is a, a piece of equipment that does something. Does it do everything? No, it does one thing, or it does. It is a tool to, to do something. That is one way of looking at it. And we've already done things like this in your life. If you had like sine of 45, that is a function. 45 degrees are going into that, and then some value is that's equivalent to some value. So um, I'm going to say float. Uh, There you go. Is equal to sine of 45, right? It's, in math terms, you do sine of 45, and you it would be there's it's a particular numeric value. We have the same thing. So, this is our very very high level at advance at a glance view of things. We're going to do a lot more than that. Hopefully, this screen is going to kick in. There you go. So, here's some a little couple rules here. Information needs variables. If you're gonna if you're gonna have some number, it has to be stored somewhere. It doesn't. The, the computer doesn't have a brain. It needs to store something, right? So we have variables where we can store our values. When we run have a function do something, you and you pass out a value, it has to be stored somewhere. You have to catch that value and store it somewhere. If you make a variable, you have to define it before you use it. This probably shouldn't be rocket science for many of you, but for many people it can be struggling. So when we define a variable, we say what type of a variable it is. Is it a char? Is it an int? It, what is it? And we give it a name, saying this is the short form. This is how I find this thing later. Right? I How do you know me from someone else in the crowd? I have a name, and I, I identifies me. And versus the guy over there somewhere. And you could put a value in these variables. Uh, you don't need to require it before use, but you should. Why? Because just in case someone doesn't use it. Right. We normally don't see it, but each of those variables also has an address, a memory address. As in, it has to be stored somewhere on the computer. It has to be stored in the computer somewhere. That has a location in space. So we have a location in space where we're storing some value we give it a short form name for it, what that where that position is, what that thing is, uh, where this, that thing is located, and what kind of data it is. And with that, it allows us to do everything that we need to do. It also allows us, as soon as we get to pointers, it allows us to just point to where that where that uh, variable is, versus just getting the value for the variable. If I use the name, I get what what's stored in that bucket, right? I, I have a bucket where I store information. If I use the name of that bucket, I get the, the, the stuff that's in the bucket. I might say, where is the bucket located? That's where a pointer comes in. Okay. When we looked at, we're going to do a lot more about functions very, very soon. So it's a module of code. It performs a particular action. It can return something or nothing. And it can have input as well. So you get have input and output. And we've seen things like the min of something, the max of something, even printf. Um, it sometimes allows you to print things, but things like printf, scanf, they're both functions. 
all of these things that we've been doing have most of the time we've been doing a lot of functions even if you didn't realize it and we've looked at some libraries like the standard library uh, standard in standard out so uh, we're going to jump ahead of past this, but our function generally has, uh, oh, I, well, I might as well do it here. So our function, I said, looks like this, right? We have something, we have something going in, maybe, maybe three things going in. I don't know. The number of things going in is variable, can be variable. Number of things going out, one thing goes out. That's it. So I might have, let's see what kind of function we have. Let's do, actually, we're going to I'm going to do min with you guys in a second. So let's figure out a good function. Um, trying to think of a good oh, min factor, maybe. OK. Uh, int. Okay, what the heck is this function doing? So, I have some curly braces to open and close it. Anything in that curl, indented from those curly braces, inside the curly braces is in the function. This is my input. I have some input. This is output. What I expect from this particular function is if I call, um, Let's say min factor of eight. Let's say. If I have some, I'm going to make a variable of type integer named factor. So I get a chunk of memory the size of an integer where I'm going to store some value. Min factor will return some value. What would I expect here? The minimum when I'm factoring numbers, that means breaking it into the smallest prime numbers. So the factors of 8 are 2, 2, and 2, right? That is how I factorize 8. 8 is 2 times 2 times 2. 9 is 3 times 3, right? The, the prime numbers, a bunch of prime numbers, multiply together to give you that original number. That, In case you, if you're not used to all the mathiness, that is something that you can do with every positive integer after 1. You can factor it, or it itself is a prime number. So I could do min factor of 7 as well. Uh, so let's do that too. Well, factor two. I'm going to put a seven. That's a prime number. So what would I expect for these values? I would expect factor to return the minimum of these factors. I would expect it to have be the value two. Uh, or let me, maybe we could change it to twelve. Let's do twelve. So 12, what is 12? 12 is 2 times 2 times 3. That will give you 12. There are th three prime numbers that combine together, and only those three prime numbers combine together to give you the value 12. So I would expect this thing. That should be the value 2. And since 7 is a prime number in itself, it doesn't, you can't break it down into anything else. It's not a multiple of a bunch of other prime numbers. It's just 7 times 1. Since it's a prime number itself, well, then the prime number, the value it should return would be, should be the value 7, right? If I, you know, I could try other numbers as well. 11 should also give me, a, the, the minimum factor should be 11. Um, 14, the minimum factor should be 2, right? 2 and 7 gives you 14. But the small, the smallest number there, is the two. Okay, and my min factor function, I'm going to use a for loop because I'm going to get ahead of myself a little bit. I'm also going to change. I'm going to give myself some space. All right, and I'm going to. What am I going to do? I need to figure out first of all, uh, what are my edge cases? What are my different cases? So I want to, before I code, I'm not thinking about coding yet. I'm going to just plan out my attack. So what are my edge cases? What if I have zero? Okay, what should it return? Okay, that's going to be weird. What if I have a negative number? What should it return? 
What if I have one? What should it return? What if I have two? What if I have seven? What if I have 12? These are the things you want to think about before you dive into this thing and plan. So in this particular case, I might say it would return itself or the minimum factor. So if it was a negative number, it would return a negative that, that same negative number. If it's zero, it returns zero. If it's one, it returns one, something like that. Um, this is just me improvising something. So this is not, I might want to redesign my function to, to change it to something different, but I'm going to have it uh, return the value. So it's going to greater than one. All right. This is a little note for myself. Okay, so I can have an if statement if two factor is less than um, is it less than or equal to one. I'm going to get out of this. So all right. Otherwise, what do I need to do? I need to keep on going from two all the way up to two factor. Theoretically, I can go smaller than that, but I can go up to two uh, from two to two factor, and as soon as it's divis one's divisible by the other, I could stop and just return that number. So in the case of min factor, I div say is twelve divisible by two? Yes, it is. I return the two. If I go to minimum factor of seven here, I'd say is two divisible by seven? No, it's not. How about three? No, it's not. How about four? No, it's not. How about five? No, it's not. How about six? No, no. seven. Right. That would be, this is a brute force and ignorance way of doing it, but I like it. We'll, we'll do it for now. So I'm going to do a for loop. Int i is equal to zero. Just to remind you guys, uh, for anyone that's not taking my class, I don't like thinking any more than I absolutely have to. My for loops always look the same way. I have, I start at zero, I go to some stopping condition, I plus plus. That way I'm not beating my brains over how the hell to do this thing. I just sort of memorize it, all right. Or I've just sort of taken it upon myself to do a particular way. There we go. That's a terrible curly brace, but that's what it is. Um, if, so I want to, I'm gonna use mod, which is the remainder. Okay, if that's equal to zero, as in it's evenly divisible, I'm going to actually I'm going to do a new line. <sighs> the curly braces are going to get out of hand here. I'm just going to return. I would normally put my curly braces in here, but it's one line. Uh, return i. Otherwise, I want. And that's really terrible. I'm sorry. There we go. Outside. Outside of my for loop here, uh, I'm going to say return. Return two factor. Right. But essentially, it looks like this. Uh, it's called two factor again. And a bunch of stuff inside, right? That's all a function looks like. The reason I'm asking for this, I want you to take it out a piece of paper. I needed to work through all of this for you to have seen some example of this. I want you to take out a piece of paper. No, uh, normally I would have people to pass it in at the end. We're not passing it in obviously or anything like that. But I want you to write the function min. It'll take in two integers. It will return an integer. It's going to return the smaller of those two input parameters. That's it. So min of five and seven. You can call it my min or whatever you want if you don't want to call it min. So min of five and seven means that uh, it would return five. 
the integer min val would equal to 5. It's the minimum of these two numbers. But if I have 7 and 5, it were to return 5 as well, right? I'm not saying what the inputs are here. It can be anything. And so people sometimes just say return 5. And I'm like, no, it has to be whatever the input parameter is. Things are coming in. I want you to return the minimum value. You clearly can't pass in the, uh, the sheet of paper. OK, try that. If you are lost and you do not know how to do this, my suggestion is to panic. Not really panic, but you need to get help right now. That is the absolute minimum amount of work that you would I would expect you to be able to do starting this class. You need a lot more practice if you cannot do a function that takes a minimum of two numbers. It takes in two val values, spits out one other value. That's all it does, right? It spits out the smaller of the two values. And you need to be thinking of, like, what are the different edge cases? What are the different things that, you know, what possible values could you have there? Where do things get a little tricky? It should be a really, really ridiculously easy thing, but if you haven't been doing this in a while, it's going to be hard. And so I want you to try it out. And then when we come back from our little break, we're going to be going over the solution. Okay.